Each of you possesses the most powerful, dangerous, and subversive trait that natural selection has ever devised. It's a piece of neural audio technology for rewiring other people's minds. I'm talking about your language, of course, because it allows you to implant a thought from your mind directly into someone else's mind, and they can attempt to do the same to you and without either of you having to perform surgery. Instead, when you speak, you're actually using a form of telemetry, not so different from the remote control device for your television. It's just that whereas that device relies on pulses of infrared light, your language relies on pulses, discrete pulses of sound. And just as you use the remote control device to alter the internal settings of your television to suit your mood, you use your language to alter the settings inside someone else's brain to suit your interests. Languages are genes talking, getting things that they, that they want. Language is a virus from outer space. Now, this is a very strange thing for a writer to say that the language is a disease communicable by mouth. Uh, but it's also a very uh, suspicious and a very Buddhist thing to say as well. In Buddhist thought, the thing, and there's the name for the thing, and that's really one thing too many, because sometimes you, you know, you think if you, if you hear a word that you understand it, all you're doing is, is hearing it, so language is a trick. But what about writing? And uh, by that, I mean all languages. English, Chinese, Mayan, Egyptian, whatever. I mean, okay, maybe language talking is our genes talking, but words, written words, have evolved way too quickly to have come from our genes. And although I do kind of vote for the aliens, and I vote language came from the jumping alien in the back, I have some doubts about that. Personally, I have another idea about writing. Because you see, I think writing is just pictures that we tell secrets with. And what's special about secrets is that you like to share them, but you don't want to share them with everybody. Well, for the most part, we really don't have that much trouble seeing that Older scripts look like pictures, take the Mayan or the Egyptians, and even if we don't speak Chinese, most of us are aware that Chinese was originally based on pictures and has evolved and become more and more abstract. But, well, most languages, I mean English, I mean Russian, I mean Arabic, no, 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 we, our languages are abstract. We're not talking about pretty pictures anymore. We're talking about symbols and their phonic. But is that true? Is that really true? And while I am, to a large degree, speaking out of my own cultural background, um, those who come from the Arabic world and from China, where, in Japan and Korea, where calligraphy is so much a part of writing that the separation between language, the visual arts, is practically non-existent. In that case, forgive me for speaking the obvious. In European countries, in America, it's still very much true that we are socialized to believe our alphabet is something different than a picture. Okay, we see it. And okay, as young children, we use pictures to learn our alphabet, but that's just for mnemonics to help us remember. It doesn't have anything to do with it being a picture. As it turns out, our alphabet does have its origin in pictures, and those pictures come to us from the Egyptians. Yes, the Egyptians, but not the Egyptians you're thinking of. The alphabet doesn't really seem to come, at least from what evidence we have, from the pharaohs. It comes from the slaves. Yeah, the little guy, not the big guy they're lugging around. In fact, 
the connections are so eerily strong that the word alpha, from which we get uh, the word A, and the word alf for ox, 2,000, no, 4,000 years ago, are the same. If it doesn't give you chills, it oughta. While, in a way, does it matter? Yes, it started out pictures, and now we have a neat little typography that we can play around with in Photoshop or Word. What does that really mean? I mean, we're talking about a completely abstract system now, right? We all acknowledge the intonation and the way we speak influences meaning. But if we don't understand how visually the context and the connotation influences meaning, then are we actually literate? And if we were illiterate, who would benefit? Who benefits from illiteracy? Well, the same people who always have pharaohs. Of course, it wasn't always this way. In the Middle Ages, there was absolutely no disconnection between word and image. It seems like more than coincidence that with every rise in literacy since the Renaissance, there's been an increasing disconnect between images and words. There have been notable exceptions, like William Blake, the great poet, artist, and bookmaker. What happened between the coming of the printing press and the beginning of the 20th century to so disassociate words from their physical manifestation and make it so that the cubist choosing to use a word in a canvas became a revolutionary act. It wasn't as though images stopped being associated with words in popular culture. In fact, with increased illiteracy, they became even more important. The 19th century saw many of the innovations like Japanese uh, manga and comics. But something changed where in the Middle Ages, every peasant knew and could read the cathedrals around them. How many Christians today could walk into a church and explain the meanings of the symbols they see? And still fewer people able to see the intricacy in language in Kinte cloth, where there are over 300 distinct patterns, all named, all with distinct meanings, and that's only one kind of textile in Africa. Words like cloth get their meaning from their visuality, from being, for want of a better word, a picture. It is this taboo and this paradox that fueled much of the 20th century's artist's approach to text and language. Just start talking a sound of tone. Originally, this is the, these are the words of William Burroughs. Language is a virus from outer space. And he means by that, you know, that language is a disease, you know, communicable by mouth. That we don't use words very well, that we're just always oh, talking like this, you know, shouting or whatever. We're not listening, we're not using it like this. So, oh, he meant probably a lot of other things too. But, uh, I. I'm glad he said that because I communication takes place on so many levels. You can have a very automatic conversation with somebody and you realize you're just repeating what you said many times. You're not even really listening to the other person. 
So that's why I like to, I think language is often a defense. And that, that's why I like, to, when, I, when you stop talking, then that's maybe when you start understanding who you might be talking to. If you just look at them for one second, you know, and are always doing this. So that's where I'll stop talking. Yeah. <laughs>